here's where we are. So uh, last time we talked about monohybrid crosses. There's really simple Darwinian method of looking at the genotype and phenotype of organisms. And we went through these, Mendel's postulates. So they, they look kind of wordy, but trust me, once you figure these things out, you'll discover Mendelian genetics is really, really easy. It's about the simplest kind of genetics we got. So Mendel's postulates are, first the important one, everything is in pairs, right? So there are pairs of unit factors that somehow, Mendel had no idea, that somehow specify the phenotype of the organism, what it looks like. The other thing is, he could characterize these unit factors as either dominant or recessive. So if you had a pair of them, one of them was dominant, and that's the only one you'd see. And the recessive one it would be in hiding. We are going to discover next week that this, this is not always true. But that's okay. For, for Mendelian genetics, we just assume dominant and recessive. And then the other important thing is postulate three. It's all random. It's just chance which one goes that where. And the chances are all equal. It's always 50-50. So that, that makes a lot of the calculations really, really easy. We're also going to see later it's not always 50-50. There are other factors that can modulate the frequency. But you don't have to worry about them for Mendelian genetics. Okay. Punnett squares. I told you before, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Punnett squares. They're kind of pretty, and they're kind of easy to view, and it makes it easy to absorb these ideas. And so here's just our standard Punnett square for uh, a, a simple cross. This is a monohybrid cross, so we've got one individual that's contributing pollen. We got our big G and our little g there. They go on one side of the square. We got the other individual also contributing big G and little g. They go on one side of the square. You just fill in the blanks. And you can see the genotypes laid out there. And you can also figure out the phenotypes. So it's pretty straightforward. It's going to get cumbersome really fast. Because when we start thinking about dihybrid crosses, uh, that Punnett square has to become 4 on the side. And then suddenly there are 16 little boxes you have to fill in, and 16 little boxes you have to count. It makes it really easy to make errors. Okay, here we go. So here's all the possibilities for a two-factor or single-factor cross. So again, we're looking at our friends, uh, the dominant yellow allele, which is big G, and the recessive green allele, which is little g. And let me just take a moment, a little aside on this, on the naming of these things. We always name our new factors after the mutant phenotype. The weirdos get the credit. So this is an allele that is, causes this recessive green color, so we call it green. And it's got two alleles, it's got green and yellow, which sometimes gets confusing. We'll get more into this a little later when we talk about fruit flies, where it can get really confusing. Okay, so we got dominant, we got a recessive, standard Mendelian postulates, and uh, I've given you here six different arrangements, six different kinds of crosses. So you can imagine big G by big G, and what do you get out of that? You get 100% yellow, 100% big G, big G. Obvious, right? You should be able to figure these things out just at a glance. 
I've done them so many times that all six of these I've got memorized. And you show me any one of these crosses and I will be able to spit out right at you what the results will be. But you don't have to memorize them. You can derive them every time. It's that simple. You can just see the way there in that point square. So easy. Here's the case we talked about last time. Big G, little g by big G, little g. There's our little Punnett square. And you can see there are four different possible results. Big G, big G, that's one quarter will be that. And it'll be yellow. There's two squares that have big G, little g. Because big G is dominant, those will also be yellow. So 50% would be big G, big little g, and also yellow. So 75% are yellow. And one quarter are little g, little g, and green. All right, so I want this to be second nature to you all. We'll be doing some practice problems next week. We'll just drill it in your heads, and you'll see a monohybrid cross, and you'll say, ah, boom, I know the answer to that. I don't even have to think, it's just a reflex. Here's the answer. Okay. So does that mean that a dihybrid cross is also going to be more difficult? Here's the new stuff for today. Oh man, suddenly we have dumb, doubled the number of factors we have to deal with. This is terrifying. We got more work to do. Okay, so what Mendel did is he did these, what he called two-factor crosses. He's combining different things. So remember I showed you those seven traits, seven, that uh, Mendel looked at last time, and we saw that there were these seven different possibilities. And I told you he was a, he was a very strict reductionist, so he don't only really look at one at a time. So let's, let's just look at uh, green pea color. Green versus yellow. And then there's another one. Let's look at round versus wrinkled seeds. We'll look at that one completely independently. So he worked out all those rules, those, those three postulates using just that simple kind of cross. But then for a challenge, he said, okay, now, what do we get if we combine those? What if we have a round yellow seed and we cross it to a wrinkled green seed. Will we see a different effect? Will something else happen? So he did a whole series of experiments where he did that. And uh, this is just an illustration of exactly that experiment I was just telling you about. So we start off, just look at the left side for now. Just, just ignore that one for a minute. So what is he doing? He's taking his seeds. He's got a round yellow seed. Remember, round is dominant to wrinkled. Yellow is dominant to green. So this is two dominant traits. And these are pure breeding seeds. So he's, the genotype is big G, big G, big W, big W. And he crosses that to a seed that is green and wrinkled. And that's two recessive phenotypes, right? So it's little g, little g, little w, little w. So you cross those, and each of these will produce their own gametes. So yellow round, this P here, can only produce gametes that contain a big G and a big W. Remember, they're haploid. So the gametes can only have one half of the alleles present in the parent. So we get big G, big W, and this one can only produce little g, little w, and we're going to cross those, and the end result is right there, we get big G, little g, big w, little w. You shouldn't be surprised at any of that. Okay, and in that case, it's going to be yellow and round, because it's got one copy of the dominant allele from this parent. Okay, what do we see over here on the right side? It's just the same thing. Again, Mendel did this, just varied the arrangement of the alleles. And right here we just see, okay, there's, there's our yellow wrinkled, wrinkled seed. In this case, it's yellow, which is dominant, big G, big G. 
but it's also wrinkled, which is recessive. So big G, big G, little W, little W. And we're going to cross that to a green round one. So that's little G, little G, big W, big W. And there's the gametes they make. And you, those get fertilized, and you get the exact same result you get with this cross. So big G, little g, big W, little w. And that's telling us it doesn't matter what the arrangement is in the parent. We're just going to randomly sort them out. So we'll always get the same result. So we get this kind of individual from both of these crosses. It's a heterozygote, so it's a heterozygote for both loci. Okay, now I defined those terms last time, so it should be clear to you now. So we got our big G, little g, big W, little w, c here. And we're then going to ask the question, what happens if we salt this? In pea plants, you can do this. There's a lot of other organisms you can do it too. Selfing just means you take pollen from the same plant and apply it to a flower of the same plant. So it seems kind of circular. It's like being able to self-fertilize yourself. That's what these plants can do. So we're just going to do a cross by of this by itself. So big G, little g, big W, little w by big G, little g, big W, little w. Sounds straightforward, I hope. And Mendel asks, well, what's going to happen there? Oh, and here's our results. I told you, I told you I don't like Punnett squares. I think you can sort of see why here. In order to illustrate that, we need to do a four by four Punnett square. So what you see here is uh, there's a cross. That's the same P we showed you in the last slide. And so on one side we got uh, the gamete, big G, big W, big G, little W, little G, big W, and little G, little W. All right, uh, let me just take a moment and clarify this. Oh, the Sharpies will hit the screen now. So, we've got this individual. And we're asking you know, what kind of gametes can it produce? And we should do this. We got all the combinations, all the possible combinations. So we're going to split this down the middle here. We can make big G or little g gametes, right? So it can make those two kinds of gametes. It can also make big W and uh, little w gametes. But it also, this is also implied here because it's going to be a random assortment. You can also make big G, little w gametes, and little g, big w gametes. So you have to figure out all the combinations of the gametes that you can produce. This is, this is all of them. This is the entirety right there. One of the things we're going to see and it's going to be the basis for Mendel's fourth postulate, is you can ask, what's the frequency of these? And it's 25%, 25%, 25, 25%, 25%. 25%. 25%. 25%. 25%. 25%. 25%. 25%. That there's an equal probability. Is that necessarily true? No. Yeah, there's, you're correct. That's not necessarily true. You can imagine situations where there's a bias for certain gametes to be produced. We'll get into that later. But for Mendelian genetics, you just say, hey, it's random and it has equal probabilities. So we're always going to get a one to one to one to one ratio in this case. And that works nicely for our Punnett square. So this has an equal probability to this, has an equal probability to this, to and to this. All right, the other partner is producing the same four gametes. We line those up over there. 
And then we fill in our Punnett square. Like I say, this can be a little tedious. So we've got 16 total squares in, that, in, in there. So we've got 16 possibilities. And we have just said that the individual probabilities of each of these is 25% or one quarter, right? One quarter for each of these, one quarter for each of these. So each of these boxes in the Punnett square has a 1 16th chance. Think back to that first week, right? Product law. So one quarter times one quarter means this has got a 1 16th chance of having that result. So each of these has a 1 16th chance. So one of the things we can do is we can figure out, okay, well, let's just, let's just count them. So let's look at round yellow. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's all we got. Nine round yellow seeds. That's nine times one sixteenth. So there's a nine sixteenth chance that any one seed is going to be round and yellow. Oh, and then we can look. Okay, what about round and wrinkled? Or round and wrinkled? Where's round and wrinkled? Uh, oh, oh, no. Correct me on these things. The round and wrinkled are two of the alleles. Yellow and wrinkled. What's the chance of being yellow and wrinkled? Uh, there's one, two, three. So you get a 3 sixteenths chance of being yellow and wrinkled. What about green and round? And there it is. One, two, three. Three sixteenths. <coughs> green and wrinkled. There it is. One sixteenth. There's only one of those. So this is something we'll see over and over again in dihybrid crosses, where you're crossing two heterozygotes, you will see that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. 9 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths, 3 sixteenths, and 1 sixteenths. And the pattern is the 9 sixteenths will be dominant at both loci. They'll express the dominant phenotype at both loci. So 9 sixteenths are going to be dominant and dominant. 3 sixteenths are going to be dominant and recessive. The next 3 sixteenths will be recessive then dominant. And finally, the one that's recessive and recessive, that's only 1 sixteenth. Seems easy, right? Yeah, except that I find filling out these Punnett squares tedious. Okay, but this is Mendel's fourth postulate. So he says, during gamete formation, segregating pairs of unit factors. So in our example here, the segregating pairs are uh, the, green, the green locus versus the wrinkled locus. That those segregate independently, they're a, a sort independently of each other. And this is just a long-winded way of saying, yeah, there's, there's a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio that you're going to see out of this. That, they, that all combinations are equally likely. And we've got four combinations right there. And each one has a likelihood of 25%. It's not like there's a bias where green always likes to be with wrinkled. No, it's, it's equal opportunity. It's equally happy to be paired with wrinkled and round. All right, this turns out to be a really powerful tool. We can use this. So there's different ways of solving these problems. Uh, one way, uh, the hard way, don't do this, I don't recommend it at all, is just memorize the outcomes. Yeah, so here's a table of all the genotypes that result in the F2. And the phenotypes that get in the F2, there's that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Yeah, you could memorize that. Sure, memorize that whole table. Uh, it's not very helpful. Or you can figure out how to reconstruct it, how to derive it yourself just by glancing at the problem. And so that's what we'll focus on. We'll take a mathematical approach to this. And don't worry, it's a really simple math. Multiplication of fractions. You all learned that in fourth grade, right? I hope. Okay. 
We can do variations on these crosses, and that's just shown here. So we can carry out a, for instance, a dihybrid test cross. You got a P that is round and yellow. That is, it's got the two dominant traits. And then we might ask, okay, but what's the genotype? Is that round, a pure breeding round? That is, is it, is it really big W, big W? Is that yellow a pure breeding rounding? Is it, is it uh, big G, big G? Or is it heterozygous at those, at those low signs? You can't tell when you got the dominant phenotype in front of you. So what you'll often do is a test cross. So here's examples of that. So right there is our, our round yellow P. And in this case, it's, its genotype is big G, big G, big W, little w. We're going to do a test cross and see the results from that. Oh, that's easy. You remember what a test cross is for monohybrids, right? You just cross it with an individual that's recessive at the loci you're interested in. So in that case, that would be with a pain wrinkled P. Little g, little g, little w, little w. We're going to cross those two and ask, what do we get? And now again, we can draw, this is the truncated P, uh, Punnett square. But you get the idea. It kind of, it's got two different kinds of alleles, alleles this guy can make. Big G, big W, or big G, little W. This one can only make little G, little W gradients. And when you combine those, you will get some round and some wrinkle, 50% of each. Okay, so you just look at the phenotype. That tells you, ah, oh, yeah, that, that parent plant had to have been heterozygous for seed shape. Okay, over here we're going to cross it with an individual, uh, we got a heterozygote, still round and yellow. We're going to cross that to the double recessive individual, little g, little g, little w, little w. And there what we get is one to one to one to one ratios. So this will produce four different kinds of gametes, just like I illustrated over here, remember? So we've got four different kinds of gametes. Each with an equal probability. This individual only produces one kind of gamete. So we just get four results from our Punnett square. And we see the four different phenotypes up here. So this tells you it's got to be heterozygous at the seed shape locus and at the seed color locus. And then over here we got big G, little G, big W, little big W. Uh, and again, this is just like this one over here. We cross those and we can see, okay, they're all, they always come out round. But half of them are green and half of them are wrinkled. Now again, you could memorize this. Yeah, you could memorize these rules. That would be easy. But here's the big secret between behind Mendel's fourth postulate. Is you don't have to. By Mendel's fourth postulate, every dihybrid cross you can break down into two monohybrid crosses. It's really that easy. All you gotta know, all you gotta do is know how the monohybrids work. And this in this cross here, this dihybrid cross, is simply two monohybrid crosses, and they they have no effect on each other because of Mendel's fourth postulate. And so you can just take the results and multiply them out. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means, for instance, you could say, okay, well, first of all, I'm just gonna look at, at the G's here. So for a moment, ignore the W's. Just pretend they don't exist. So we say, okay, we got big G, big G, by little G, little G. And you will say, oh, well, that's going to lead to 100% being big G, little g. That's it. They're all, they'll all be heterozygotes, all the progeny. So we got 100%. Got one. Just write that down. One. And then we look at the other one. Big W, little w by big W, little w. That, by that. Again, ignoring the Gs, just look at the Ws on this one. 
And what do you get out of that? Well, you're going to get uh, oh, big W, not this one, big W, little W by little W, little W. And you look at that one, you just look at the, at the W's, the seed shape, and you can see that half of them will be big W, little W, and the other half will be little W, little W. Okay, so we got 50% are going to be wrinkled and 50% are going to be round. And we just said, okay, 100% are going to be yellow. So you just multiply those together. 100% times 50% is 50%. That's our split. So this is, this is going to happen a lot in these next couple of examples. Is the key secret is you just split them down into monohybrid crosses. And you all know how easy monohybrid crosses are. Dihybrid crosses are just two monohybrid crosses multiplied together. And that means you can solve trihybrid, tetrahybrid, pentahybrid, hybrid, hexahybrid, any number you want. It's all the same thing. You just take each part at a time, figure out, figure out those probabilities, and multiply them all together. All right, sometimes the tricky part is just figuring out the gametes. Okay, so, so you look over there and you see, ah, yeah, okay, I figured out the, 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 there are four different gametes that result from this individual, and they all have equal probability. The number of gametes, the number of possible combinations of gametes increases rapidly as you increase the number of loci. So like you see here, I'm saying, okay, what if we, what if we do a tri-hybrid cross? That's three different loci. And it turns out that three loci has eight different combinations of gametes you can produce. And you're saying, what orifice did you pull that number out of? Where did eight come from? Uh, the answer is, it's two to the number of loci. So if we've, got, if we've got three loci we care about, that's two to the third, which is eight. So there's eight different combinations possible. What if I told you I want to do a pentahybrid cross? I got five different loci. How many different gamete con configurations could there be? 32, yes, two to the fifth, that's 32. Lots of different possibilities there. And you see how that number is just going to go up and up and up as you get larger and larger numbers of gametes that you deal with. Uh, but that's what we got here. So we, we got eight different possibilities from this cross. So I'm saying we're going to cross big A, little A, big B, little B by big C, little C by big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C. Okay. Immediately we see eight different kinds of gametes that can be produced. You're sitting there diligently taking your exam. You say, okay, I just have to draw a Punnett square with eight different possibilities on each side. Eight times eight, 64. We need a box with 64 little elements in it. And I just told you 16 is awful cumbersome to deal with. 64 is going to be worse. Okay, if it was, if, if it was five different loci, Ooh, 32 different kinds, of, 32 by 32. I don't know, that's a huge number. Yeah, your entire exam hour is spent just fiddling with this stupid little set of boxes. And then afterwards you have to count all the different, oh man, you don't want to do that. That's, that's terrible. Okay, so what I'm saying here is this gets unwieldy really fast as you increase the number of loci. But again, Mendel's fourth postulate is going to come to the rescue. There's an easier way to do it. And that's called the fourth line method. Okay, what is the fourth line method? Here's an example of the fourth line method. So up there you see, okay, there's the cross I just mentioned. We get, uh, we get three loci, heterozygous, at each of them. And we're going to cross those together. 
And we want to ask, what is the probability of each possible result? And it's simple. Yeah, don't make a, don't make a giant Punnett square to do this. All you got to do is, again, thanks to fourth, the fourth postulate, just break it down into three different problems. So all we care about is, okay, let's first just look at A. So ignore B and C. Just pretend those don't exist. So we got big A, little a, by big A, little a. And this is an example of saying we want to find the phenotypes that result from this. Uh, so what you do is, is look right here, you see there, that's a mono, monohybrid cross of big A, little a, by big A, little a, and you already know the answer to that one. You figured that out, well, days ago, maybe longer ago. So we know at this point that it's going to be three quarters are going to express the dominant phenotype. Three quarters are going to be big A, and one quarter are going to be little a. Okay. Easy peasy so far. Yeah, we just do one at a time. Uh, then we look at B. So ignore A and C. Just pretend they don't exist. And look at B, and that's big B, little b, by big B, little b. And you can do this in your sleep by now. And that's going to result in three quarters expressing the dominant phenotype, big B, and one quarter of the recessive phenotype, little b. So we're going to write those down. Look, a fork line. That's what we're doing. We're just drawing a fork line for at that point. So you could be, three quarters will be big A, and three quarters will be big, day, big B, and one quarter will be little b. And then we write it down again. Yeah, you don't have to think. You just copy it down here for this one. And we got another fourth line. Then you say, okay, let's forget about A and B. A and B don't exist. We're just going to look at C. So big C, little C, by big C, little C. And once again, monohybrid cross. You're saying, ah, that's, that's a dawdle. We can do that easy. So there it is, three quarters big C, one quarter little C. That's, again, that's the phenotype we're looking at in this case. Okay, we've, we've done all the calculation of the frequencies that we need to do. And then what we can do is we can just follow the fourth line. Okay, what's the likelihood of big A, big B, big C? We go zoom, zoom, zoom here. Three quarters times three quarters times three quarters. And that turns out that's 27 sixty fourths. So 27 sixty fourths of the project will be big A, big B, big C. We can do that for any of these. So, uh, for instance, there, there's big A, little b, little c. Go three quarters. Little b is one quarter. Little c is one quarter. So three quarters times one quarter times one quarter. That's three sixty-fourths. So you can fairly easily figure out the likelihood of each of the possible results just by following that chain of reasoning. Are there drawbacks to this? Yes, there are. There's a drawback to this method. Uh, if, if I were doing a, a five locus cross trying to figure this out, uh, it would be easy to run out of paper because each time you have to make a fourth line for each of these possible results. And that means we've got to go five levels deep. There'd be a whole lot of forks here and a lot of calculations to do. Uh, so generally, you'll only use this to say, okay, I want to know, I want to know a specific outcome. I, I, want, I don't necessarily want to catalog every possible result, but I want to know roughly how many, oh, let's pick one down here. Uh, let's see, I want to know roughly how many little a, big b, big c's are around. And then you just, you just think it through. Okay, what's the frequency of little a? Well, it's one quarter. Frequency of big b is three quarters. Big c is three quarters. So you just go one quarter times three quarters times three quarters. It's nine sixty-fourths. Yeah, I will not give you an exam where I say, okay, here's, here are six loci, <clears throat> here's the cross, figure out every single possible result. That, that would be too much tedious make work for you. Maybe if you're in some big research project where that's your, that's your whole topic of research, you might need to figure out all those possibilities. But here, we just need to see that you can follow this path of reasoning to come up with the appropriate result. All right.
So here's just a, a simple little ex exercise. So I'm telling you, okay, here's an example. I am going to cross big A, big A, big B, little B, little C, little C, by big A, little A, little B, little B, big C, big C. And I ask you specifically, what's the likelihood of getting that result? Big A, little A, little B, little B, big C, little C. So we want to figure out how to do that. And once again, fourth postulate to the rescue, just do one part of the cross at a time. So what we might say is, okay, big A, big A by big A, little A. Again, we're ignoring B and C, and we want to get big A, little A. What's the likelihood of getting big A, little A out of a cross between big A, big A, and big A, little A? Say what? 25. Uh, no, again, look here. This is what we're crossing. So big A, big A by big A, little a. 50%. 50%, yeah, because you're either going to get big A, big A, or you're going to get big A, little a. So you get 50% will be heterozygous. So we figured that one out. So the probability of that and across, it's again, you just break it down into the individual components. Probability of that result in the cross of big A, big A by big A, little A it is 0.5. And you're all sitting there, you're looking, oh, that would be such a simple problem. Can you keep giving us that kind of simple problem? But the thing is, under Mendelian genetics, they're all that simple. Okay, then the next step. Let's just look at B. Okay, there's B. We got big B, little b by little b, little b. We know what's the probability of getting the homozygous recessive result? Little b, little b. So again, blind count, everything else. Big B, little b by little b, little b. What's the probability of that? 50% again. Yeah. See how easy this is? And then we say, okay, well, what about the third locus, C? We got little c, little c, by big C, big C. What result are we going to get out of that? 100% are going to be big C, little c. Right. So that's 1.0 for us. Now we want to ask, we want to answer the whole question. We want to know what's probably getting this specific result out of this cross? And the answer is, you can do math, right? Multiply. What's that? 16 64ths. 16 64 That would be, oh, that's one quarter, right? Yeah. Or just take 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 1. 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 is 25%. So yeah, 16 64 works. All right, you see how we do this? It's fairly painless. What, that's, what this means also for you is, is when you get an exam for me and you look at a problem, you see, I see all this detail I've thrown at you. Usually what you can do is you can say, wait a minute, uh, that's, that's too complicated a problem. Geneticists love elegant solutions. So all I have to do is break it down into a bunch of smaller problems and multiply them together and we get the answer. That's usually how it works. Okay, here's another example. So in this case, we're asking about phenotypes. Now this works for either genotypes or phenotypes. In this part, I'm asking for a specific genotype, right? In this one, we're saying, okay, what's the What's the likelihood of getting the, the phenotype big A, little b, big C in a cross of these genotypes? All right, once again, we break it down into three problems. We just focus on one locus at a time. So we got big A, big A by big A, little a. What's the probability of getting a phenotype of big A out of that? Uh, let's see, yes. 
Yes, because we're always going to have that fig A from one of them. Uh oh. How did I do that? Oh. Yes, there's a mistake here. I made, I made it. It sometimes happens when you're doing a whole bunch of these all at once. Yeah, this should be 1.0. You are correct. I'll go back and fix this. Anyway, uh, what's the probability of getting little b out of a cross of big B, little b, by big B, little b? 25%. Let's see if I did the math. Yes, I got one right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we should see there's a 25% chance of getting that. What's the probability of getting big C out of a cross of little c, little c by big C, big C? Again, we're asking about the phenotype. 100%. Okay, so uh, that should be 1.0. So what's the probability of getting this specific phenotype out of that cross? Yeah, 1.0, my mistake, times 0.25 times 1.0. And that's really the nature of all of these problems. As long as we're talking about simple Mendelian problems, it's, it's really that easy. You just break it down into individual components. Okay, so you've all mastered that, right? Right? You're all you all understand this, which means we're all done. You have mastered Mendelian genetics. Really, when we talk about Mendelian genetics, this is all there is to it. Those four postulates, some general assumptions, like that there's always a dominant and recessive form, uh, that the probabilities of individual events are totally random to the sense in the sense that they're 50-50. Well, we worked those all out, and now we're all done. You know, you know Mendelian genetics, which means what we need to do now is figure out who's going to bring the champagne in the cupcakes every day of class from now till the end of the semester. We we can rotate. We'll work it out. Okay, that, so this is the third week. I can't possibly be done with this class already, right? Uh, what this is telling us is uh, there's more than just Mendelian genetics to worry about. So Mendelian genetics is the foundation. You should be able to do these simple Mendelian problems, some of which are on the exam that's waiting for you right now. No problem. And then what's going to happen is we're going to discover that there's all these kinds of things that extend Mendelian genetics, that modify Mendelian genetics, that actually makes some of the assumptions of Mendelian genetics false. And we'll have to deal with those over the course of the rest of the semester. So yeah, I'm sorry, we're, we're not really done. We just got, we got the basics done. That's, that's all we've got done. So what are we going to do next? Well, I'm going to let you guys go early today because I gave you an exam, right? So you're going to go work on that exam. It's due Friday at midnight. Uh, then also, I am not assigning any homework for this weekend. So yeah, you can go party down or just take a nap, relax, something uh, this, this weekend. I'm also not assigning any reading for the weekend. Ooh. See, I can be nice sometimes. Um, but after that, uh, on Monday, the plan is you're going to come in and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of simple Mendelian problems. And you're all going to say, oh, that sounds easy. That's kind of a vacation too, I hope you think. So I'll give you a whole battery of simple Mendelian problems. We'll just work together on them in class. So we'll get in groups and we'll try and solve these things. Uh, some people are doing this asynchronously, and they're, they're doing this, trying to do this at home, which means they won't be here to help us. Uh, what I'll be doing instead is on the Canvas page, I will put a Zoom link, and if you missed, if you missed class on Monday, or if you just want to do another review, that will be an opportunity for you to get together with me, and we'll do some, we'll work through those problems together in small groups there. Uh, then on uh, 
Wednesday. We start again, chapter 4, extensions of Mendelian genetics. So we're going to talk about some really simple extensions that were made pretty early on to Mendelian genetics uh, before we get into the hard stuff. Yeah, there is hard stuff coming. Okay, any questions? Any questions about Mendelian genetics or questions about the exam? Uh, is your question, how quickly can I get out of here now? Yeah, you can leave. It's okay. So we'll see you on Monday for more problems, and I'll look forward to seeing your exams this weekend.